Well, hi, and welcome back to module five of this course on implementing databases with Microsoft SQL Server. Um, we've covered a lot of ground up to this point. It's been a fairly uh, long day for both of us so far. <laughs> we've covered tables, we've covered indexes, um, we've talked about uh, stored procedures and um, functions, and we've talked about transactions and isolation levels and locking and all of that good stuff. We're going to um, switch gears a little bit in this module and talk about um, some of the in-memory capabilities that have arrived in SQL Server 2014. Now, for those of you who are preparing for the exam, the exam was originally um, based on SQL Server 2012, uh, and so, of course, didn't cover any of the, of the new technologies, um, but it has been updated and revised with some additional objectives uh, and additional questions that cover the, the 2014 um, additions to the product. And most of those uh, changes in 2014 relate to the in-memory capabilities. So if you are going to be sitting the exam, um, then you, you do need to have an awareness of, of these uh, 2014 specific technologies. So that's, that's why we're going to cover them. Uh, Christian, do you want to tell us what we're going to look at in this module? There? Sure. Thanks, Graham. So, um, so first of all, so we're looking at uh, the in-memory features that are predominantly um, new for SQL Server 2014, but I'll talk about the specifics of that shortly. So the first feature we're going to have a look at is the buffer pull extension, or BPE. Then we're going to talk about column store indexes, which were introduced in SQL Server 2012, uh, but we've had some, some changes and enhancements in SQL Server 2014, so we'll talk about those differences there. Um, and then finally, we'll finish off by, by talking about in-memory OLTP, which is a brand new kind of headline feature for SQL Server 2014. All right, fantastic. So. Let's uh, start with the, the buffer pull extension then. Tell us Great. about that. Uh, so the buffer pull extension. So the idea behind the buffer pull extension is that it enables you to extend SQL Server's cache. It's a non-volatile storage. And what we mean by that predominantly is um, uh, very fast storage. So solid state storage is really this kind of target. Uh, and you can think of it like a, like a, a Windows paging file, if you're familiar with how that works, okay. but for SQL Server. So what we're looking at is uh, clean pages, so committed data that sat in, in SQL Server's data cache will be uh, paged out to this buffer pool um, extension that um, isn't as fast as RAM but uh, is faster than the traditional spinning disks that, that you might use. So a couple of, it's really easy to set up, and we'll see that in a demo, but a couple of you know, interesting scenarios for this. So the first thing to mention, actually, is that it's, um, it's a feature that's available in SQL Server Standard Edition. Um, and the first scenario that, that, that I kind of think about for this is around virtual machine density. So if you think you have um, a really large um, host, a Hyper-V host with, you know, let's say 256 gig of RAM, and you need to host some large SQL servers on that host, um, you know, let's say you want um, four 64 gig uh, SQL servers on there. So that's fine, and you can give each one 64 gig. Um, but if you use this buffer pull extension, you can really extend the usage of that and maybe give you know, each one 32 gig, but a buffer pull extension of 128 gig so that you can provide each one with a lot more kind of usable buffer pull space. So the idea is that you could get more on a, on a physical box than, than you could if you didn't use this type of technology. So you're substituting your... Um your actual RAM in, in, in the sense of memory chips in, in the server for fast storage where, you know, if we went to a traditional kind of um, mechanical disk, there's a significant performance difference in exactly. reading and writing data between RAM and disk. Whereas if we go to a solid state disk, then it's, it's somewhere in the middle. It's, it's, it's neater to the RAM level than the mechanical level. So it's, it's, it's going to yeah, be quicker true. to that. And, it, you know, it's certainly true that um, RAM is is relatively cheap these days, mm -hmm. but when we're looking at consolidating and virtualization, um, everything has a cost, and the more we can sweat these assets, if you, if you like, um, the more kind of options that we have around kind of mm -hmm. configuration and, and, and getting the best out of things. I, I guess it's worth pointing out, I probably should have said this up at the, uh, the, the, the top of the slide, this module is about in-memory technologies. This isn't specifically an example of in-memory technology. If anything, it's almost the the opposite of that, but but what it is doing is is kind of ad addressing the importance of how we manage memory and how we manage 
data that is is perhaps temporary rather than volatile rather than um, you know permanently persistent to disk. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're talking about something that SQL Server does anyway. It does a pretty good job of managing the cache so that data that's accessed frequently is is held in RAM. What we're doing is just being smart about extending that out to free up RAM for for other processes, or as you say, if we're consolidating multiple servers on the mm -hmm. same physical box, but still getting the, the performance benefits of caching by using fast storage to, to take the place of the RAM. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And another scenario that, that, that I've really kind of considered for this and that we've used with a few customers actually is around public cloud virtual machine density. So you can get um, Microsoft Azure virtual machines with um, SSD storage presented. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the bigger the virtual machine, the more RAM, uh, the more expensive it is, mm -hmm. as, as with any kind of public cloud provider. Now, you could get a relatively small virtual machine um, with, say, I don't know, 8 gig, 16 gig of RAM with standard edition SQL Server. Standard edition has a, a limit of 128 gig of RAM. But you could then extend that onto um, the SSD provided with the, B, the, with the VM and really get this massive buffer pool. So you could extend that by 128 gig, 256 gig. You know, the idea is that you have, you'd have a VM um, with 64 gig uh, and then you have a buffer pool extension of 256 gig. So you're enabling the product to do more with those resources without having to get a virtual machine that's five times bigger and upgrade to Enterprise Edition as well. So it gives you a lot more kind of configuration options to be right. creative with the solution. So, so frequently accessed data that, that traditionally you would cache in RAM in order to get to it quickly if you don't want to you know, pay for that amount of RAM that you, you would have in a, in a public cloud hosted uh, server, you can move that to fast storage in effect yeah, and, and, and get a lot of the same benefit from caching it, but without paying the cost of yeah, that I mean, it, it's not going to be as effective as having all of it in RAM, sure. but uh, you know, standard edition of SQL Server is limited to 128 gig of RAM, um, and this is a way for you to provide 256 gig of RAM, albeit a level one and a level two Right. style RAM, but um, you know that may suit the needs of, of, of your application and give you a bit more kind of flexibility around that. No, oh, very nice. So let's take a look at just how easy it is to, to set that up. So uh, this is a, it's really, really simple to configure. Um, so all I'm going to do is alter server configuration. I'm going to set the buffer pull extension to on, and I'm going to specify the file that I want to use for my buffer pull extension. So in this case, I'm going to create a 10 gig file, and SQL Server is automatically going to use that as, as an overflow for, for RAM. So let's just enable that. And in this example, you've done that in the the temp folder on C. I mean, obviously, just for the demo, that works. Of in course, reality, yeah. we'd do this to a perhaps a dedicated S. In fact, probably a dedicated SSD yeah. device for this. So the ideal scenario for this is that you would have very very fast solid state storage, and maybe even um, storage that plugs directly into the motherboard, so you're not going through the disk subsystem. Um, that's really what you're going to get the the best performance out of this. But the idea is it's the you would put it on the best storage that you have or the fastest storage that you have available. Okay, great. But yeah, obviously I'm running on my laptop, so I've only got a C drive. <laughs> um, so now that's enabled and we can actually have a look in um, the buffer pull extension configuration to see the details. So we can see that it's enabled and it's been set to 10 gig in size. Okay. We can also have a look at DMOS buffer descriptors. Now, this uh, DMV is going to return one row for every page that is held in cache, so this data cache. Okay. Regardless of whether that's RAM cache or... Exactly, exactly. Oh, okay. So, and then what we see from here, so we've got one row for every page in cache, mm -hmm. um, and we now have this new column in 2014 is in buffer pool extension. Okay. So we can see when we're writing queries to analyze the configuration of the server, um, we've got the amount of data pages here, which databases they're from and file IDs. So we could write quite complicated queries to, to really kind of pull out mm. the how much cache uh, 
a particular database has in RAM, how much of that is been moved to the buffer pool extension. But the, the whole aim behind this concept is that you would enable it and SQL Server will just use it in the background right. if it thinks it would benefit from it. So you don't need to do any more configuration than that. Okay, yeah, fantastic, sounds good. Um, and it, switching it off is as simple as buffer pull extension off. And there and we go. It's off. Yeah. yeah. So it's very straightforward. Uh, it's easy to switch on, easy to switch off. If the drive that it's running on runs out of space or are there any problems there, it will automatically turn itself off. So it's a very um, um, easy configuration to set up and just maintain and, and, and run in the background. Right, yeah, I was going to ask you what happens if the drive gets pulled and it, it, the system detects that that's happening. Yeah, just, because the, the only pages that will be moved to the buffer pull extension are what we call clean pages. So these are committed pages that haven't changed, whereas a dirty page is something that would be a main RAM that maybe we've changed in RAM but that hasn't made its way down to disk yet. So we're only going to move clean pages out to the buffer pull extension. So if we lost that disk, we've got no data loss at all. We've just dropped stuff right. from cache. We're not losing any transactions by doing that. Exactly. All we've done is lost, lose the whatever was in cache, and the next time it gets queried, it'll be brought into cache. Exactly, again. exactly. OK, great. Well, let's, let's go back to the slides. All right, so that's the buffer pool extension. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you mentioned right at the beginning was column store indexes, and I, I know these were around in in 2012 and they've been hashed in 2014. So, so tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, so, so fundamentally a column store index is it's a different way of SQL Server storing the data in a table effectively. So what we have here on the left is a traditional row store. Uh, we've got two boxes there representing two different pages and we've got um, four pages, four rows on each page there. Just get my screen together. Mm -hmm. um, and on the right hand side, we have a column store index where it's been um, stored in a completely different way. So, so for the row store, on um, the all of the columns for every row are stored within a single page. So ex if we take this example of data page uh, 1000 on the left there, I've got four rows and all of the columns for those rows. So a row can't span multiple data pages in, in that Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and then we've got another data page, and then we've got another four rows there. So, and that's the traditional way that SQL Server works and, and stores pages. Mm -hmm. But in this kind of uh, data warehousing scenario, so we've got large scale reporting and, and, and large tables. So we've um, denormalize the table construct and we tend to have very wide tables. When we're doing reporting off those tables, we tend to report on really a subset of the columns in the table. Mm -hmm. So we're not returning all of the columns, we're returning a subset. Um, and if we're returning a subset of columns, row store isn't the most efficient way mm. of, of, of storing those rows. So this is where column store comes in. So the diagram we have on the, on the right hand side, we've got um, three pages there, um, but each page only contains data for a single column. Right. So they're all 8K pages. So, and if you think how many, uh, the number of rows that you can store on a page will depend on what columns you have and the data types because that influences the size of a row sure. and it's all got to fit within 8K. But whereas on a column store, if you take a single column, you can store many, many more rows for that one column yeah. on a single page than you could if you had all of the columns. And this is the first principle behind this, this column store technology. Because if we're reporting off a subset of columns, um, and this example, if I wanted to, uh, to, to find all of the order dates or I'm doing a calculation on the order dates or whatever, if I'm reading a single 8K page there, I can read four times as many values than I could as if I was reading order dates from the mm a traditional thing. So I'd have to do two 8K reads instead of one 8K read. So this is the first area where we're making a lot of savings in, in, in reading lots of data at once. So that's the first area. Um, I guess the other thing here is compression. We know that the exactly. column store takes advantage of, of uh, the, the same technologies that we use in, in things like um, Power Pivot, which is a, 
a technology for Excel where we're able to store huge amounts of data in memory by yeah. using in-memory compression. So. Um, how, how does that play into this story? So, so the compression, so as well as storing column level data, we're also going to compress uh, the data as well. So that means we're saving in two areas there. We've got more, a lot more of one single kind of, uh, one single column on a, on a single page, and it's compressed. So the amount of the volume of data we can read from a single 8K page is, is, a lot more than we could read in a traditional row store model. Sure. So it's all about speed of, of reading. And the, the idea is that you can you can read so much that you could do aggregations on the data on the fly instead of having to, to do these these pre-calculations. Oh nice. Okay. So let's let's look at some scenarios for where, where we might want to use this. Clearly, you know, if the, if this was a, a panacea, we would just change the way that SQL Server stores data all the time. So yeah. there are some scenarios where this is more appropriate than others. Let's let's talk about some of those. So it's really most suitable for, although as a technology it will work, um, it's really designed for data warehouse um, scenarios. So we're looking at star or snowflake schemas. So for those of you that, that have uh, uh, worked in the BI world or have done the data warehousing exams will be familiar with these terms. Mm -hmm. um, tables that have a large number of rows. So if you don't have very many rows, you're not likely to gain from the fact that we've got an enormous density of rows per page. Sure. Um, and and data that responds well to compression. If you've got a table full of GUIDs, mm -hmm. it's not going to compress very well. No. So we're looking at lots of repeatable data, uh, text data is really going to compress yeah. uh, really well and is really an ideal candidate for, yeah. uh, for a column store. It's, it's worth thinking about how, how, you know, compression works in many different ways, but it's worth thinking about the idea that in a data warehouse scenario, like we're talking about here, where you've got a star or a snowflake schema, the fact that you've denormalized the data means there's duplication. And duplication is a, a great friend if you want to compress because instead of storing the same value 100 times, you can store it once and say, yeah, the next 100 rows yeah, store exactly. the same value as this one. So uh, you, you can compress very very much that way. All right, well, let's, let's look at different types of column store index. And then people who are familiar with SQL Server 2012 but not 2014 might wonder what we're talking about. So let's let, let's talk a little bit about that. So a custom column store index is brand new for SQL Server 2014 and um, it's a much lauded feature. When, when uh, column store indexes came out for 2012, uh, they were fantastic, but one of the limitations was they were read-only. So the fact that we've got this clustered column store index in 2014, uh, where we can create this index and read and write to it, is a real boost in the, um, the applicability of this technology to, to far more wide-ranging um, scenarios. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you create a, we talked earlier on in one of the previous modules about clustered and non-clustered indexes, yes, and, and we did, yeah. roughly speaking, the, the same uh, sort of rules apply here. You can have one clustered column store index. As it happens, if you have a, a, a column cluster store, uh, a clustered column store index, it can be the only index on the table. You can't have any additional indexes. Yeah because it, it must include all of the columns in the table. So effectively, you turn that table into a, a, a table that's stored in this columnar format, and that cluster effectively defines the table. Exactly. Um, so, so that's our, our, our cluster column store. And, and as you see, that's updatable. We've still got the, the non-clustered variant from the previous version. So. Yeah, exactly. So non-clustered column store indexes was uh, the feature that was enabled in SQL Server 2012. And we still have that as, as an option there uh, in the fact that we could define um, a column store index as a subset of, of columns in the table. Um, we can combine it with other indexes as well. Um, but one of the limitations, or well, the, the big one, mm -hmm. is the fact that it makes the table read-only. So the way that we would have got around that in SQL Server 2012 is that you'd have nightly table loads and then you'd create the clustered index mm -hmm. uh, non-clustered column book store index, and then you would use that for read workloads during the day. And there, there are very, I don't want to give the impression that, uh, hey, you should throw away all your non-clustered ones and, and use clustered ones because th those are updatable. Um, in that data warehousing environment that we're talking about, actually your fact tables tend not to be updated very often anyway. They tend to be read, read yeah. mostly databases, I guess. And even when you are updating them, if you've got a non-clustered uh, index, particularly if it's, let's say, a partitioned table, which is not uncommon in a, yeah. in a data warehouse, 
you can create the non-clustered column store index on the table, you can create a table with a matching non-clustered uh, index, and you can switch the partitions. So you could actually you know, load a, the new data that you want to add to your fact table, create a, a non-clustered column store index on that, which will be fairly quick because it's only the, the new rows that you're yeah. adding on a daily load, let's say, and then switch that partition into an empty partition in the, in the fact table. And you're able to update the table in, in that technique as well. So there's, you know, it's not a, a, it's the end of the world, it makes the table read only. There are techniques you can use to, to make effective use of these things. But certainly the, um, the clustered column store index uh, where the table is updatable um, on a day-to-day -day basis makes it easier to do those kind of ad hoc inserts and updates and, and yeah. so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Should we have a look? Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, so I'm going to use the AdventureWorks Data Warehouse database for this one. I'm going to uh, execute this query. A couple of joins, um, just to get it into cache. Now I'm going to set statistics time on and statistics IO on, because uh, we want to compare and contrast the, the execution time to this. Um, and I'm going to run this query. take a measure on the messages here. So what we're looking for here is this. Um, so we've got a CPU time of 1766 mm -hmm. and a, a elapsed time of 909 milliseconds. Okay. So let's take these stats off. We're going to create a non clustered column store index. A second to create. So we try and insert a row here, which will fail. Why will it fail? It will fail because it's a non-clustered columns or index, exactly. so the table's read-only. So it's read-only. So we can't update a table with a non-clustered column store index, uh, but we can read from it. So let's set these statistics back on um, and see if we can spot an improvement here. So we've now gone down to 483 of CPU time. So that was 1766. So what's that? A third? Yeah, that's a significant a improvement. Before. And if you think, you know, the larger that table would be, the more dramatic the improvement Absolutely. would be. It was pretty quick to begin with because it's just sample yeah. data. But if you had a query that took several minutes to run, cutting that by a third is, is actually a, a fairly significant Yeah, game. or two thirds, in fact. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So let's. Um, Switch those timings off again, and let's um, drop that index. And we create a cluster column, clustered column store index, so that's going to affect all of the columns. Notice now that we can insert the rows that, that so fail. So previously. the table is updatable, like a regular yeah. table. We'll switch that on. Hopefully. So, and again, it's there or thereabouts. It's yeah. just a little slower in this instance, but you know, other factors would affect that. It should be comparable to the normal. But, but from the original query, yeah. it's still uh, more than two thirds faster, mm. which is 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 quite significant. Uh, it's quite a significant gain. Mm. I guess just before we switch away from the yeah. demo, one one thing I do want to sort of add to all of this. We've we've talked about the fact that a, a clustered index is updatable and. Uh, a non-clustered, other than using various techniques, makes, makes the table non-updatable. Um, I just want to kind of explain a little bit of how that works under the covers, mm -hmm. because when you use a non-clustered column store index, one technique that, that's quite often used is you have your, your table, which contains your data, but you may create something that goes along with that table, another table that has the same structure, which you use as a kind of temporary writable space. And when you query your, your, uh, your table that contains the non-clustered um, columns or index, you union the results with this, let's call it a delta table, yeah. which contains the changes, and then periodically you merge those in. So there's, there's a technique where you can implement some logic to effectively combine two tables into one logical view of the data and then periodically merge the changes in. And actually, under the covers, that's how a clustered columns or index works. Internally, SQL Server maintains a traditional row-based delta table portion of that, that table, 
plus the column store in memory part. So when you do an insert or an update, what actually happens is that delta store table is, is modified, it's stored on disk until we reach a threshold where a certain number of pages have been updated. And at that point under the covers, SQL Server will take those and absorb them into the column store area. So there's, there's a, a, a certain amount of additional complexity under the covers when you use these things that you might not immediately be aware of. Mm. And there are dynamic management views you can use to see well what's, what's currently in the Delta store versus what's been absorbed into the, the table itself. Um, but it's, it's worth being aware of that. Yeah, excellent. Okay, let's switch back to the slides. And moving on from there, let's look at, I guess, what most people will think of as, as the in-memory feature for, for 2014. This was the big headline um, additional new uh, capability in SQL Server. The code name was Hecaton. For a while, we had lots of people talking about Hecaton. Mm -hmm. So if you do hear that word, it refers to this technology that we're going to talk about now. So Christian, Perfect. take it Thanks. away. Thanks, Graham. So in-memory OLTP, uh, as, as Graham said, is the brand new feature for SQL Server 2014. The code name for it was Hecaton, and it's still kind of referred to as, as Hecaton. It's a bit easier to say than, than in-memory OLTP. <laughs> but certainly for the purposes of, of the product feature in the exam, um, it will be in-memory OLTP. So it's essentially a high-performance OLTP feature. So online transaction processing is, is the, the target scenario for this. And it consists of uh, two parts, memory-optimized tables and natively compiled store procedures, which are used to access memory-optimized tables. OK, so um, let, let's deal with the first of those two things and let's look at memory-optimized tables. So let's have a talk about what are memory optimized tables. So, so what's quite interesting in the fact that uh, this in-memory feature for, for SQL Server was really designed with two, two parts in mind. Um, it had to be part of the product itself, not an add-on an add -on product, product uh, and it needed to be integrated. So you didn't have to have an in-memory database. You could take the parts that were relevant to you and, and put them up in memory. And the first thing is a memory optimized table. So when you make um, a, a table memory optimized, SQL Server will actually take that definition as a C structure and compile it into DLLs and load it into memory. So every time you then insert into that table, what's happening under the covers is that SQL Server will be using DLLs to interface with that table because it's not a normal table structure anymore. So it's actually be it's. it's Converting your transact SQL that you use to create the table is converted to C, which is then compiled to a DLL, and that DLL is loaded. That's what's in memory. That exactly, DLL. exactly. So it's okay. very, very um, high performance and very efficient. So we don't have any locking semantics on the in memory tables. So we don't have any um, locking and blocking problems. So everything will run using snapshot based um, isolation levels. Um, we can index using hash indexes. Okay. Um, it can coexist with disk-based tables, and this is really the, the key thing for integrating this technology into existing applications. As I mentioned before, you don't need to have this separate database, this separate application that you're rewriting. Um, it can coexist with, with disk-based tables, and you can also query a memory-optimized table using T-SQL as well. All oh, right, so I don't have to write any different query, I query it just like an ordinary table using a transact SQL. Yeah, exactly, oh, exactly. Okay, great. So uh, scenarios for memory optimized tables. So the, the real key scenario where um, you get the most benefit from this is where um, really kind of high concurrency um, scenarios where you've reached the, the scalability limitations for the traditional architecture around SQL Server. And this is this limitation around locking and latching. So regardless of how fast your memory is or your, or your disk is, we're still bound by this fundamental structure of latching um, pages in memory and the blocking that's associated with those. So without those, those latching mechanisms, the throughput that you can get and the scalability is, is much, much greater when you're looking at um, memory optimized tables. Right, and, and we, we talk about hot pages there. I, I, I always, whenever people ask me about this, I, I always sort of explain this as being, imagine you've got a, a table of orders and you have an incrementing order ID key and you've created a clustered index on that key. Well, what that means is all the inserts are going to happen in the last page. Exactly. So if you've got lots and lots of, of client applications trying to insert data at the same time, 
they're all going to be on the last page. At some point, that page is, you know, we're going to escalate a lock to page level and start yeah. blocking any new orders being taken. So those, those types of, of structures, which, which make sense in themselves, um, can lead to you having pages that are particularly, you know, commonly accessed, and those become your hot pages, and that kind of leads to a lot of blocking. Yeah. So th this type of uh, technology is, is really designed to deal with You've, you've got an, an application design that gives you this hot page, that leads you to an awful lot of locking and blocking because you've got lots of concurrency. How do you deal with that? Yeah, and it's really targeted at, at massive scale. Yeah. You know, the, the scenarios that this fixes, it's not that the product doesn't work, it's the fact that you're trying to do so much against these tables that you get these hot pages and SQL Server will manage concurrency on those pages uh, with latching, which is a, a lightweight locking mechanism. Um, and because we don't have any of this, um, these um, locking semantics and we don't have latching uh, involved, the throughput that you can get from that is much, much higher. Okay, great. So let's look at uh, how we actually create these things then. I see we've got a, n a number one in the slide title, so I'm guessing there's multiple steps. So why don't you yes, talk us through? Yeah, sure. So the first thing we need to do is to add a file group for memory optimized data. So we've got an alter database here. We're adding a file group um, that contains memory optimized data. So this is a very specific um, file group that's going to take um, a file stream data. And in the next statement here, we're going to add a file, um, specify the file that we're going to add, um, and, we're, and it's um, uh, added to the file group mem data in this example. And I guess in case you're confused, because we're talking about in-memory data, you might be wondering, well, why do we need a file group? It's just purely a, a, a semantic of the way that tables are created in SQL Server. Yeah. Tables are associated with file groups, so we, we have a file group that's effectively there as a placeholder for you know, really the metadata that defines that table. And when we persist, you know, although it's held in memory when we're using it, it's persisted to disk so that it survives restarts of the exactly, server. So yeah. uh, that's why there's a, there's a file group associated with it. So the next slide then is around creating a memory optimized table itself. So we're using uh, the normal create table statement here, but we're also adding uh, a couple of extra commands in here. So we're adding a non-clustered hash index here with a bucket count. Mm -hmm. So this bucket count um, is the number of hash buckets that we're going to make available for this. Um, and the, the number of buckets that you should have ideally should be um, the number of uh, unique values that you'll have in that column. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's flexible enough that, that you can have um, non-unique values and it will link those together. It's, it's perhaps worth just, just stepping back for a minute before we finish talking about the, the overall syntax. One of the things that's different about memory optimized tables is is the indexing, mm. uh, because indexes, as as we know from previous modules in traditional tables, are disk based themselves. They're pages that are stored on disk, and they, yeah. they may be cached, but but fundamentally the disk the the index is stored on disk. There are two types of 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 a uh, index that we can use with a memory optimized table, and the this variant that we've got here is a hash index. What actually happens is that the key or or keys that you're uh, the key column or the key columns that you're using for the index, a hash algorithm is applied to them to generate some sort of unique um, value that, that, that you can get from those values. That then determines which location in memory this row is going to be stored. So it's, it's, it's very much a case of we hash the value that's, that's the index key. That identifies a, 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 effectively a pigeonhole in memory in, in RAM where we're going to put this, this row. Now, of course, it's possible that two values will hash to the same value, so they'll mm -hmm. end up in the same location in memory. And if that happens, what, what's then stored in memory is the first value that was put there with a pointer to the second one and a pointer to the third one. So you end up with a what's called a linked list structure. And this, this type of index, a hash index, is very, very efficient if your queries are searching on equality predicates. So if I want to find all of the sales where the customer name is Malcolm, it's an, I would search for equals Malcolm, it's an equality predicate. So it hashes that one value, Malcolm, goes and finds the location memory where the Malcolm records are stored, and it finds them very quickly. There is an alternative um, type of index called a range index, which conceptually is very similar to, to the more traditional SQL Server indexes we know of that are kind of binary tree uh, type structures. Um, it, again, it's in memory, so it's, it's not exactly the same as a, a, a traditional sort of clustered or non-clustered mm. index we'd create for, for a disk-based table. 
but those are more effective if your queries are likely to search for ranges of values. So find me all the transactions between you know, November and the following January. Um, that's a range of values you're trying to find and that's going to be more efficient than trying to calculate all the individual hashes that are possible between those values and find the locations in memory. So we're, we're kind of just showing you the syntax. Hash we've highlighted because it's new. It's, 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 you won't have seen that type of index before. It's not the only game in town when it comes to indexing in memory tables. So yeah. you, know, you, need, you need to consider that. Anyway, I've probably diverted us far enough. No, 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 that's fine, that's fine. If you move the, if we move the slide on, actually, mm -hmm. there's a, a, um, a couple of points there, just reiterating ah. what... what, what um, there you go, I've peaked too soon. ...what Graham was mentioning, <laughs> that's fine. So let's move on to talk about uh, querying memory optimised tables and, uh, and try and understand a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so first of all, so we mentioned in the beginning that, that you can... Uh, you can have a memory optimized table and that you could write a query that accesses a disk based table and a memory optimized table as well. Um, and the way that it enables us to do that uh, is through this query interrupt. Interop. Um, so we can uh, combine the two together. Okay. And the other way that we can access tables is through native compilation. So this is store procedure converted to C and, compi and can compiled, um, where you can access only memory optimized tables. So what's interesting about the native compilation is that when you write a store procedure normally, um, T-SQL is an interpreted language. So while we, we have it compiled, it's essentially interpreted. interpreted. So when we execute the code, um, it it has to line by line execute that that uh, what you're trying to do, uh, which is fine under a traditional model because we're so dependent on disk-based tables that having an interpreted language to access those tables was an insignificant cost in the in mm. the wider cost of, of 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 execution. But now we've got these structures that are memory-based and they're not just pinned in memory. Um, they're actually memory optimized structures that we can get significant savings not just by having um, a table that's optimized to be in memory, but for optimizing these store procedures as well. And, and when you natively compile a store procedure, um, it's compiling it into C code and, and presenting this, uh, this um, compiled C code that is far more efficient to execute. So, so the path that we've got there though, if, if I've got a compiled, a natively compiled store procedure, it can only query memory optimized tables. I can't use that to query. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we can have uh, a normal query can can read from both, okay. but a memory optimized store procedure um, can only access in memory tables. All right. Perfect. Should we have a quick look? Let's have a look. So let's have a look at memory optimized tables first. What we're going to do here is to create a new database specifically for this. So let's do, um, well, let's just keep it simple. And do create database mem demo. So now we're going to go into the properties of this new database. So, so far it's just a regular database. There's Absolutely. nothing special about it. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to create a new file group in the memory optimized section down here, you'll notice. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna call that MFG. Um, and now we're gonna have a look at creating a new data file. Uh, we'll call that uh, well, let's call it mem demo two, okay. um, and we're going to put that. No, we're going to put it in. So this new file type we have here is file stream data, and because the file group that we've created is memory optimized, mm -hmm. it's the only file group that's available for file stream data. I should point out that there is a technology called file stream that's about storing files in SQL Server, or at yeah. least storing documents in SQL Server, and they're spilled out to the, the, the file system. This is, is potentially confusing here. We're using the same type of, of file group as you would use for 
for file stream storage. Yeah. We're not using file stream storage in, in, in the sense of that feature. We're just using the same type of, of file group to store memory optimized data. Exactly. Yeah. So let's create that now. So now what we're going to do is to um, use this database. We're going to create a table that's optimized for in-memory. We've got this uh, non-clustered hash with the bucket count. So this is exactly what we saw in the slide. Mm -hmm. And just uh, again to, to interject, I, I, just, I detracted earlier on when we moved, uh, I, I, I mm -hmm. diverted us off when we talked about the, uh, the, the syntax. So we didn't really have a, a, a chance to talk about this durability um, flag that's here, the, the, yeah. this option. Uh, and again, it's probably worth mentioning that there's two different options. This one here is schema and data. Mm. So what we're saying is any data that's inserted into this table or updated will be persisted to disk. So that exactly. if the server goes down and comes back up, we don't lose the table. Yeah. Why would I ever want to have durability just the schema and not the data? So you can think of a scenario where um, you're, you, don't, you're, you don't need to persist the data. So you're looking to, to have data temporarily um, that's held in, in, in memory. Um, and you may want to have durability on the, on the schema and, and not the data as well. So maybe session data, I guess, for, for a website or yeah, a shopping cart one. that if the server goes down, okay, we lost the shopping cart, but yeah. it wasn't a, a persisted order. Or exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. Um, so we've created that now, and what we're going to create for comparison is um, the same table as a disk, normal disk based table. So this is the same structure, but it's a traditional exactly table. The same, okay. Exactly the same structure, yeah. Um, and then we're just going to insert 500,000 rows into the disk based table and just have a look at the timings of that. And you're doing that within a transaction, so it's, it's going to lock as we as we do that. Yeah, case. exactly. Yeah. So um, so that took six seconds to run. I don't know if you can see in the bottom right hand side of my my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we just have a look at the contents of that table, we've got five hundred thousand rows there. Okay. So um, and now we're going to do the same, exactly the same thing into the memory table. And that's taken five seconds to run. So I was expecting it to be a bit quicker than that, but it's still better than it was yeah. onto the um, the uh, the traditional table. Okay. So let's have a look. So we still got five hundred thousand rows there. Right. Um, now let's have a look at a delete. So if we delete from the disk-based table, uh, so that's second. taken a second to do that. Uh, and if we delete from the memory table. So we're sub-second on that. So the scale that we're running on this, it's always quite difficult to, to work out the scale because the laptops get faster and faster and faster. Sure. Um, so the, 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 the performance gains from a demo perspective can be, can be quite small, but, but hopefully what we've demonstrated here is the, um, the interaction we've had and the comparison between a disk-based table and a, and a memory-optimized table. Right. And there are performance gains uh, that we had through that process. And, and I have seen demos where you know, it's a much more dramatic difference as, as you scale Absolutely. up. As, as you see, your laptop's clearly a very powerful laptop, so the disk-based table is performing well. Yeah. But I, I, I've seen demos where the, you know, the disk-based subsystem is, is significantly slower and the semantics of the locking is significantly slowing things down. So there's a dramatic difference between the, the time it takes to run yeah. those two. There are, two there are a few times with this laptop where I regret the fact that it's got very, very fast SSD storage when I'm demoing the difference between that and the memory. So what you're saying is if I'm implementing a, an enterprise system, I should either use in-memory technologies or I should use your laptop. My that's, laptop. That's the time. <laughs> OK. Uh, and then finally, finally we've got some uh, memory-optimized stable um, statistics that we can get um, uh, pulling this out of this uh, additional DMV that we have for, um, for in-memory. Oh, so I can actually keep track of, because obviously the data is in memory, I want to keep track of, well, what, what's that doing How to my big overall is memory it? usage? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's quite, it is quite useful. Okay. Can I ask you, just before we move on to, yeah. the, to the next little section, could you um, bring up the, the, the file explorer and let us have a look at the file system? Because I, yeah, I think it, sure. it's probably worth exploring a little bit about what's being created. So if we're going to, uh, where, where our SQL Server databases are stored. Um, it's probably... If it's 64, but it'll be in there. Yeah. 
Yep, so take, a, take a guess. No, it's no, not there. Any other one? So into the data folder, there's a an XTP folder. Let's let's have a look in there, and into nine, and you you see a bunch of files here that have have been generated. Now these have been generated by SQL Server, and anybody who's done any. Uh, software development will we'll recognize some of these that are, that are um, object files and PDB files and out files which, which are used as part of the compilation process to ultimately produce that DLL file which is the DLL representing our mm. table. And I guess what's really interesting is right at the top of that list there's a C file. So if you can go ahead and, and double click that guy and let's open that up in Notepad. Here's the actual C source code that SQL Server has generated to represent that table. So there's a struct in here that is used to, to implement that mm -hmm. table, which will have all the public fields that are the columns in the table. So you can actually drill right under the covers and see what's going on uh, when, when SQL Server actually generates these, these in-memory tables. Pretty good. So, and we talked about our, our tables. Um, one of the things we didn't see in the demo there that we mentioned earlier on was, was natively compiled stored procedures. So let's, mm. let's, let's have a little chat about those. So, so we've, uh, we've mentioned this before when we were talking about this, uh, this query interop where you could write normal T-SQL and you could read from a disk based table and a memory optimized table. Uh, and we've also talked about this idea of natively compiled store procedures. Um, and again, just to reiterate this point, is a traditional store procedure, T-SQL is an interpreted language, um, uh, which was never a problem when we're working with disk-based tables. But if we're working with things in RAM, which is really, really fast I.O., uh, we can get a lot of performance gains if we can compile these store procedures um, into a C structs like we've seen with the tables as well. Okay, so I can see some differences in the... The, uh, the, the syntax there compared to creating a regular stored procedure. We've, the obvious one is the with native compilation. Yeah. Um, we've got schema binding, which we saw before when we talked about views. The we idea did, is yes. if, if anything underneath this, anything this thing depends on changes, well, actually don't allow anything that this exactly. thing depends on to change. We've got the execution context. So who, who is this going to run as? Um, and in this case, it's going to run as whoever the owner of the, yep. the stored procedure is. And then I've got something that looks like a transaction, but the syntax is different from what we've seen. It's begin atomic mm. with, and then I specify an isolation level for this, and it so happens you also have to specify a language, which is part of the requirement. Mm. Uh, so I guess it's worth being aware of that. The reason this is different from the semantics you've seen when creating transactions in, in Transact SQL for, for ordinary uh, uh, stored procedures is again due to the fact that it's stored in memory. So the, the underlying semantics as to how this is, is done is different. And this syntax is baked into the DLL that gets compiled. Mm. But the, the effects are the same. Effectively, we'll end up with this being a transaction that uses snapshot level, isolation level. Yeah. yeah? OK, so we'll hop back to the demo machine. Should we, should we round up with, uh, with, a, with a demo of these uh, yeah. compiled store procedures? Okay, so we're going to use this same uh, database again, just to make sure we're in there. So this time, instead of running this, this code to, to insert these 500,000 rows, we're going to create a natively compiled store procedure okay. called insert data. Um, and we're going to execute that store procedure. So can you remember how long it took to insert um, in, in, into so the memory before. optimized table when we just run the transit SQL, it took five seconds. It was five seconds yeah. and six seconds for the, yeah, the disk-based table. One, yeah. So let's see how quickly this is. So less than a second. Wow, it's instantaneous. Yeah. So, so there's a massive difference. So while we had a performance gain of switching from a disk-based table to memory optimized, the real massive gain we've got there is by switching to a natively compiled store procedures to do the same operation. Hmm. Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay. So we covered a number of things in that module. We, we talked about the, bu the buffer pool extension, uh, which was not an in-memory technology per se, but a way of taking uh, data that's normally cached in RAM memory uh, and moving that out, spooling that out onto a, a fast disk, a fast storage device, so that we're, we're making more use of our, our fast solid state storage and we're, um, we're able to uh, maximize the way that we're using our, our RAM and, and get better use from, 
from fast storage. We talked about column store indexes, um, both the non-clustered variety, which have been around since SQL Server 2012, <laughs> all those years ago, 2012, <laughs> and uh, also the, the clustered column store indexes in, in 2014, which, if you remember, are updatable, whereas the non-clustered yeah, ones make correct. the table non-updatable. Uh, and then finally, we talked about in-memory OLTP, or Hecaton, as the, the code name was, uh, where we talked about memory-optimized tables and those memory-optimized store procedures that we've just seen, where you, you can see some significant performance benefits in particular workload types. Absolutely. So, I hope you've enjoyed this module. Um, again, the usual rules apply. Go off and have a look in uh, SQL Server books online, research this stuff, play around with it for yourself, make sure you're comfortable with, with that technology and, and with these different uh, techniques, and then come back and join us for the final module in this course, where we'll look at uh, optimizing and troubleshooting performance. So I look forward to you joining us then.